Um, I'm David McFadden. I work at UT Southwestern Medical Center in the Department of Internal Medicine and Endocrinology and Department of Biochemistry. I'm a physician who sees thyroid cancer patients, and I'm also a scientist who runs a research lab focused on different types of cancer, including Herthel cell uh, cancer of the thyroid. And I was asked, uh, and I'm very flattered to be here today to be able to talk to everyone a little bit about these Herthel cell tumors. And what I want to talk about is a little bit of the kind of background of Herthel cell and then some of the ongoing research in Herthel cell tumors and how those findings may be useful for us in the future to find better ways to treat these, these tumors. So welcome everybody. If you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat um, and then we'll be looking at those during the talk and also uh, we will have plenty of time at the end as well. My talk will not go nearly an hour. All right, I have no disclosures relative to conflicts of interest or industry, et cetera. So, so nothing on that front. So a little bit about thyroid cancer in general. Differentiated thyroid cancer is the way we kind of lump uh, the most common forms of thyroid cancer, including follicular thyroid tumors and papillary thyroid cancer. And we've learned over the years, over decades of experience from many physicians and scientists that these tumors are different. Uh, not every tumor that grows in the thyroid gland is the same. And if we look at the follicular tumors, we find that most of these growths turn out to be benign growths that we call adenomas. These tumors don't usually spread to lymph nodes in the neck, uh, like papillary thyroid cancer. When follicular tumors are malignant, and when those malignant tumors spread, which is not most of the time, they usually spread to the lungs or the bones of the body. And when we look at the genetics of these tumors, the mutations, as I'll go through in a little while, that scientists have found in these types of cancers, we find that follicular tumors don't have that BRAF B600E mutation. And we know that if we look at different ways to image, to monitor these tumors, that these tumors don't show up often on PET scans. Sometimes they do, but many times they don't. Uh, and we'll talk about that uh, later on. This has a, a metabolism-based scan on how hungry the tumor is basically for sugar or glucose. If we go to papillary thyroid cancer, these tumors tend to spread to the little lymph nodes in the neck and that occurs commonly. It is uncommon for papillary thyroid cancer to spread elsewhere, even though in certain cases it does. Papillary thyroid cancers have a lot of these BRAF B600E mutations. They occur in about 50 to 60% of papillary thyroid cancers. And like follicular thyroid tumors, these are also often not very hungry for glucose, such that they don't usually show up on PET scans, even though as probably some of you know, they do sometimes. So the question becomes, where do Herthel cell tumors fit in? Are they a form of follicular? Are they a form of papillary thyroid cancer? Or are they something different? So if we look at the kind of the clinical features, the behaviors of Herthel cell tumors, we find that most of these are benign growths. Most of them turn out to be benign adenomas after surgery. So that would be more like a follicular type of tumor. But sometimes Herthel cell tumors do spread around the neck into the lymph nodes of the neck. So that would be a little bit kind of like a papillary thyroid tumor. Now they can spread elsewhere. And when they do, they often go to lung or bone. So that's kind of like a follicular tumor. And these Herthel cell tumors really don't have BRAF mutations. So that's more like a follicular tumor. And because there's a lot of features of Herthel cell tumors uh, that look like or behave like follicular thyroid cancer and under the microscope, they look a little bit like follicular tumors. They've often been thought to be a subtype of a follicular growth of the thyroid gland. Now, Herthel cell tumors often have a couple features that are different from either papillary or follicular. They rarely take up radioactive iodine. And almost always, they're really hungry for sugar. Uh, they show up on these PET scans where glucose kind of the simple form of sugar is the tracer that's used for PET scans. So I would say these tumors don't seem a lot like either papillary or follicular thyroid cancer. 
So how can we really figure out what they are? But first, how do these features impact patient care? So I would say that in some ways, minimally invasive peripheral cell cancers, when they're called minimally invasive, you can treat them a lot like follicular uh, thyroid tumors that are minimally invasive because they usually don't recur. Now there's some differences too. A doctor might be using neck ultrasound to follow patients who have peripheral cell tumors, just like a papillary thyroid cancer patient because they sometimes do, peripheral cell tumors sometimes do spread to lymph nodes. And because they're so hungry for sugar, as I'll explain in a little while, I do use more PET scanning for my peripheral cell patients uh, than other forms of thyroid cancer when I'm worried that the tumor could have spread, which is fortunately usually not the case. But when peripheral cell spreads, I like to use PET scans. Now, we also know we have some limitations. The treatments that have been developed over the past several years that target BRAF or RET mutations usually don't work for peripheral cell tumors because they don't have these mutations. Now, some herbal cell tumors have been found to have RAS mutations, which is another kind of genetic change in different cancers. And so treatments that are being developed for RAS may someday have some impact on some of our herbal cell patients. But really the bottom line is we need to figure out why these tumors are different and begin to develop ways to treat these tumors that really relate to the underlying basis of why these tumors occur. So what I wanna talk about over the next uh, 30 minutes or so, is why are these tumors called peripheral cell tumors? And what I'm gonna do to explain that is really tell you a little bit about what these tumors look like under a microscope. We're gonna ask, what do we know about the cancer genome of peripheral cell tumors? And these are really the genetic changes that scientists have found uh, across cancers that may be important for the growth of these tumors or the formation of these tumors. And so we're gonna cover, can scientists find genetic changes that are important specifically for herthal cell tumors. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the implications of some of these findings from these genetic studies for research and maybe hopefully soon someday for patient care. So do any of these findings, in other words, lead to new ideas for how we might begin to develop better treatments for herthal cell tumors? Okay, we're going to start with what these cells look like under the microscope. So traditional pathology looks at cells under a microscope using a series of kind of stains that cause some parts of the cell to look pink, some parts of the cell to look blue. And it's been known for many, many years that these herthal cell tumors have a real dark kind of pink, pink cytoplasm. The middle part of the cells, I'll show in a diagram, the soup of the cell is really pink and kind of granular. You see these little white spots in there too. And that's different than most cells and most cancer cells. Folks have also noticed that the nucleus of the cell, this part right here, this kind of purpley part with a dark purple speck in the middle also looks different in these herbal cell tumors. They have that real strong dark speck in the middle, as you can see here and you can see here. Um, and so the nucleus where our DNA is, is maintained, that looks different. And the cytoplasm, the middle part, the soup of the cell, also looks different. So this is under a normal microscope that uses light. And so over time, with the development of these kind of fancy electron microscopes where you can look really deep into a cell with really high power, scientists and physicians noticed that the herthal cells, this soup, this pink area, this granular pink part of the cell is loaded with a structure called mitochondria. And you can see these little blobs that have these little dark lines within them. This right here, this upper part of this scan of an electron uh, micrograph picture is a herthal cell. And this is a normal cell on this lower half. This is a normal nucleus with the DNA. And this is a normal cytoplasm where you see some of these kind of dark gray structures. These are normal looking mitochondria. But the herthal cell is packed full of these swollen abnormal mitochondria. And there are a whole lot more mitochondria in a herthal cell than a normal cell. So to understand all this, I kind of want to introduce the basic structures of a normal cell. All of the cells of our body kind of have a big membrane around them that separates other cells. We know that the nucleus, sort of the center of the cell, is where our chromosomes, our DNA is stored. 
these mitochondria, which I've drawn myself here, you can tell I'm not an artist with these kind of squiggly lines. This is a normal looking mitochondria. And this is considered the power plant of the cell. And I'll talk about that in just a minute, where most of the energy that's essential for a cell to perform its functions is generated. This middle part that's just in white here is the cytoplasm. This is kind of the soup of the cell where proteins are made and the proteins function, many of them that operate, that do the functions of a cell. Um, they use that energy that's created in the mitochondria. And cells generally need kind of at a basic level energy to function, to grow and divide. If we think about moving our arms up against gravity, that requires energy. So the cells have to generate that energy somehow. And they do it often by taking sugar, uh, simple sugars, breaking it down into two components, basically. It's used to build chemical energy and the building blocks of other parts of a cell, like proteins, fats, and carbohydrates that are used to build cells and perform the function. But we can kind of simplify and think of energy. The main molecule that provides energy to a cell is called ATP. And if we look at how sugar is used to make ATP and these building blocks, but focusing on ATP, there's two major pathways, major groups of, of enzymes in a way that cells use to make energy to form the function of the cells and help cells grow and help cells divide that's really important for cancer. One of these pathways, kind of the first pathway, is in the soup, that middle part, the soup of the cell, the cytoplasm, and it's called glycolysis. And this takes sugar and breaks it down into a molecule called pyruvate. And that pyruvate is then taken up by the power plant, the mitochondria of the cell. And then uh, it's called, uh, it uses a series of reactions or a pathway called the Krebs cycle. And you don't need to remember any of this stuff, obviously. But the point of it is that this first pathway that cells use to make energy produces a total of two ATP. But if we can go all the way through into the mitochondria and take advantage of the functions of that power plant of the cell, a cell can make 36 ATP. So we think of ATP as basically the currency, the dollars that cells use to build things, to grow, to divide. So if a cell can only get two dollars or two ATP from glucose by using glycolysis, the cell's really gonna wanna go ahead and continue this process because the cell gets a whole lot more money, a whole lot more energy if, it, if it's mitochondrial work and it can generate 36 ATP or $36 in a way uh, from a single uh, molecule of sugar, of glucose. So cells like to use both. And that's why cells have both. It's because it's very energy efficient and that can help a cell grow and it can help a cell divide. In cancer cells, use both pathways. There's a lot of work in the field that shows that cancer cells increase how much glycolysis they use. So cells use a ton of this, but they still use this because it's really important for cancer to get as much energy as possible from sugar because that helps it grow faster and divide. So this leads us to the question, why are these Perthal cells so full of these strange looking mitochondria? And I think it's pretty cool that that this is not a new question, and this is from 1974 when I was a mere two years old. And this is from Mass General Hospital from a physician named Farah Malouf, who was in a way my mentor's mentor. I trained at MGH under a, a wonderful physician named Dr. Gilbert Daniels, and Farah uh, was Gil's mentor. And I found it really interesting as I began to study Herthel cell cancer that in a paper published in 1974, Farah and his colleagues on the paper speculated that maybe these purple cells are full of these strange looking mitochondria because the mitochondria aren't working right. There's a defect in the mitochondria. So the cell's trying to make more mitochondria to overcome that defect. And so this question really laid unanswered for a very long time until scientists began to study what we'll call the cancer genome of purple cell tumors. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that now, about maybe there's genetic changes in these tumors that are important for the development and growth of these, of these tumors. So most cancers are thought to be caused by mistakes made when a cell divides. 
basically when a cell divides, it has to copy all the DNA in the nucleus, all of the chromosomes. And sometimes mistakes are made in that copying process that are not corrected. When that mistake occurs in a cancer causing gene that I've kind of shown on this little diagram with the red asterisk, that can begin to cause a cancer. So when this cell divides, this normal thyroid cell will say, we get one normal cell, but there's a mistake made. And so this daughter cell is sort of a cancer precursor. And now with this cancer causing mutation can go on to form a tumor. And how do we identify cancer causing mutations? Well, when thyroid cancer patients have surgery, a lot of the normal thyroid comes out along with the thyroid growth or the thyroid tumor. And so we can basically take the DNA out of the normal thyroid and use genome sequencing methods. So study the DNA from this cell and compare it to the cell. And by doing that comparison, we'll say, aha, there's a difference in this cell compared to this cell or this normal thyroid compared to the thyroid tumor. And by doing that in lots of patients and lots of cases, we can begin to figure out which ones are the cancer causing changes in the DNA compared to just random changes in the DNA that may occur here. Now doing a, this kind of work, these cancer genome studies to identify cancer causing mutations can make a big impact on how we treat cancer patients. And some examples of that are the findings of these RET mutations in medullary thyroid cancer. Now there are very powerful medications that block what this RET mutation does and that's led to a big improvement uh, in the outcomes of patients with medullary cancers. These tumors sometimes shrink quite dramatically if you block this RET uh, mutation. There are RET fusions in papillary thyroid cancers and also in lung cancers. And these same drugs that target these RET mutations often work in these RET fusions as well. The finding of BRAF mutations has led to the development of small molecule drugs that block the action of this BRAF. They've been useful in melanoma, which also has BRAF mutations and are beginning to be useful in thyroid cancer patients as well. We know that RAS mutations uh, occur in follicular thyroid tumors, and there's beginning to be a better understanding of RAS mutations and how to block the functions of RAS uh, that are working their way into the clinics in some cases. So finding these cancer-causing mutations can often be the first step to beginning to build better treatments. So what's known about potential cancer-causing mutations in peripheral cell tumors? Now I'm gonna summarize work from many labs across the world uh, as I go through some of this, and I'll highlight a little bit of data that came out of a group that I participated in as well. So are there genetic changes that may contribute to why these cells have so many strange-looking mitochondria? And are there genetic changes in the DNA uh, in the, the nucleus basically that caused these cancers to occur. But wait, when we start thinking about these mitochondria, we have to remember something that most scientists forget about all the time, that there's actually two genomes in our cells. We always think about this nucleus as the center of the cell that houses all the DNA in the cell. When we think of the nucleus as really the information storage center, and this is where all 23 of our chromosomes are located, the DNA that makes up those chromosomes. And so we have what I'll call for this talk a chromosomal genome. And that genome is huge. We think of the letters in DNA, how many letters, uh, how long is this genome? Well, this genome has 3.2 billion letters in it. Uh, and there's two copies of that. So there's a total of 6.4 billion letters of DNA kept in here. Now we have two copies of our genome because we get one from our mother and we get one from our father. So we have a maternal genome, a chromosomal genome and a paternal chromosomal genome. And one copy from each parent. Well, it turns out the mitochondria actually have their own genome too, which is very interesting. This power plant of the cell has a tiny little genome that is 16,569 letters long. And instead of two copies, our cells, every cell in the body has hundreds to thousands of copies of this genome that are present kind of scattered along these mitochondria. And interestingly, in very big difference from our chromosomal genome, the mitochondrial genome is really strictly inherited from our mother. Uh, so we don't get our 
mitogenome that I'll call it from our father. It strictly comes from our mother. So when thinking about Herthel cell tumors, we have all of these abnormal mitochondria. We have to remember, we need to look at the mitogenome too. And so the studies of Herthel cell uh, tumors have really had to use two different methods. One method, as I mentioned, to study the mitochondrial genome and the usual methods to study the chromosomal genome. As I mentioned, most cells in our body and most cancer cells have two copies of each chromosome. Now, some cancers get all messed up in this. They have four or five copies of one chromosome, one copy of another chromosome. So this tends to change in some cancers. But our normal cells have one copy. So this would be our copy from our father, copy from our mother, copy from our father, copy from our mother. Chromosome one, two, three, four, five, all the way uh, to the sex chromosomes X and Y. But we have 22 kind of non-sex chromosomes, and then we have the X and Y chromosome as well. And so when we look at cancer genomes, when we look at that DNA in the cancer and compare it to the normal, one of the things we want to ask is, are there differences in any of these chromosomes? Because that can point us to a cancer gene being located on one of those chromosomes. And so one of the ways you can look at that in these genome sequencing studies, if we look at a diagram of our first chromosome, chromosome one, again, we have a maternal copy and a paternal copy. Now our mom and dad aren't the same person. So they have little differences in those letters across the genome. So for example, I show a little G here as one of the letters of this chromosome as an example, and a T here. So our mom has a T, our father has a G. And so if we look at the DNA in a normal cell and a normal tissue, the average is that about half of the chromosomes in that tissue are gonna have the copy from the father, and about half are going to have the copy from the mother. And so that ends up being about, we look at all these little differences between our maternal and paternal chromosomes. The ratio of these is about half, 0.5. So half has paternal, half has maternal. So we did that as we were looking through Herthel cell genomes, and we saw something really weird. Whereas most of the uh, normal chromosomes in the thyroid gland, are, again, are half and half half from the mother, half from the father. We found that there were a few chromosomes that were normal in the Herthel cell cancer genome, these that have a half, but in a lot of the chromosomes uh, in the DNA, one copy totally disappeared. So instead of 50% half and half, we went to a maternal chromosome being 100%. Now we don't know for sure it's the, from the mom or the dad, but a chromosome from only one of the parents is all that existed for chromosome one, two, three, four, six. And this was really common in these tumors. So the, the take home is that in contrast to a normal set of chromosomes, these herbal tumors typically have one chromosome for most of the chromosomes. Now there's a few chromosomes they don't like to lose. They never lose chromosome seven, uh, chromosome 12 they often keep and chromosome 20 is very rarely lost as well, but this is a very unusual cancer genome for a tumor to lose most of its DNA in the chromosomes. And if we look at kind of a big picture, if we step way back, this is a diagram of a bunch of patient tumors that we studied. And we found that this pattern was really common. So there's a few tumors, each column represents a tumor, a patient's tumor, each row represents a chromosome. So these blue mean loss of a chromosome, red means gain of a chromosome. So you can see of herpal tumors, there's some that are normal. This light gray means two copies, one from mom, one from dad. This blue means they're losing chromosomes. So you can see a big fraction of our tumors lose a lot of their chromosomes. Now, some undergo a crazy thing where they then duplicate their genome. And so then they have two copies, but they come from one parent, which we don't fully understand at all right now. But as I mentioned, we also have to study the mitogenome in these tumors. So I've drawn a little yellow circle to represent the mitogenome in uh, this kind of Herthel cell mitochondria background here that's underneath it. So we know that these Herthel cell tumors have a lot of mitochondria. So we would expect them to have a lot of mitochondrial genome too. And so in our study, the study that we participated in, we found that normal cells in our study, we had about 50 copies or so that we could detect. Now that doesn't mean exactly 50 copies per cell. 
that's just kind of the normal tissue had about this much. And we saw that there was a big increase in the amount of mito DNA, mito genomes in our HERFA cell tumors. And so it turns out what we found is that there was a mutation, a genetic change in that 16,000 letter sequence of this mito genome that was really common in these tumors. And that genetic change is predicted to block the way a cell could use energy from sugar. And when we looked at, is that genetic change in most of the mitochondria? It turns out, if we look at this red asterisk to represent that genetic change, essentially all of the DNA that we found in these Herzl cell tumors, when we found one of these mutations that existed in all of these mitochondrial genomes, all these mitochondrial DNA. And this suggested that these Herzl cell tumors have a defect in using that Krebs cycle to make energy. And so this was pretty, pretty interesting. And this had been found by scientists in Italy as well. And some of the chromosomal stuff had been found by scientists in the Netherlands uh, as well. So uh, we were really interested to see this as this might be the explanation, a defective mitochondria, just as Farah Malouf and his study had predicted in 1974 that underlie why these cells have so many mitochondria. So what does this all mean? Uh, do any of these findings lead to new ideas for how we might figure out better treatments? And I'll close the talk and then have plenty of time for questions uh, with that. So without being able to use the mitochondria to produce energy, if there's a defect in this mitochondria, the cells have to really exclusively use this, this glycolysis pathway uh, to make their energy. And as I showed earlier, that you know, most cells in our body, including most cancers that arise in the body, can kind of use either, either pathway. They can say, oh, I need to use this for some reason uh, for the use of this sugar, but I'm going to pump the rest of it into here and crank out a bunch of energy that can help this tumor grow bigger. But herpal cell tumors appear to have a defect from the genetics uh, that blocks the ability to produce this energy from this part of this Krebs cycle that occurs in the mitochondria. So they're really stuck utilizing glycolysis and have a limited energy production. So the hope is someday scientists can figure out, is there a step in this pathway, which is a lot of steps. Uh, I've simplified it here. If we can find a way to block this, we could block glycolysis, then these cells ought to have no way to make cellular energy. And that should cause a cell to die. Now we have a long way to go in doing this. And there's several kind of caveats uh, that we have to think about, some disclaimers as well. The sequencing study showed that not every Herthel cell tumor has these mutations. About 60% of the tumors in our study that we looked at had these mitogenome mutations that are predicted to impair energy production. All of those wacky chromosomal changes that occurred also occurred in about half, a little more than half the patients. Uh, as well. Now, we, we need to do several things before we can really start thinking of, is this going to change treatment for herpal cell tumors? First, we have to show that these mito mutations that are predicted to block energy production actually do. My lab's working on that. I know several labs around the country that are working on that. And I would say the early word is, is that, yes, the mutations do seem to block energy production. Now, one thing we always have to think about is just because a tumor has a genetic change, it doesn't mean that genetic change was crucial for the formation of that tumor. Uh, so we need to figure out whether these changes in the mito DNA, the mito genome, and these loss of chromosomes are actually important for Herpel cell cancers to form. And so I think a big effort is to, to find models of Herpel cell tumors where we can begin to study this and figure out are these the things we need to be developing treatments for, or do we need to be looking elsewhere? And we also know that in cases where herpal cell tumors do become aggressive and do spread, they also acquire other cancer mutations that have been found in many types of cancer that arise from different parts of the body. And so some of the treatments that may be developed for other tumors that target these kind of uh, cancer progression mutations, you might call it, may someday be useful in herpal cell as well. And so I think the bottom line is we still have a long way to go and we have a lot of work to do to understand 
how to better treat peripheral cell tumors, but that these studies that kind of identify these mitogenome mutations and these chromosomes uh, that get lost in these tumors may be one of the first steps toward better, a better understanding of these tumors and kind of new ideas on how to develop treatments. I can stop here and have plenty of time for, for questions. I need to thank some people. I need to thank people in my lab. I have a wonderful set of students that study Herkel cell cancer and are making some really cool and interesting findings in the lab. I don't give a single talk uh, about thyroid cancer to, to patients without thanking the person that taught me everything I know about thyroid cancer. And that's Gil Daniels at Mass General Hospital in Boston. And I wanna acknowledge that what we've learned from Herkel cell came from many people. There's scientists all over the world that have uh, really made key insights into these tumors. And I've listed some of them here, Ian Ganley, Jim Fagan at Sloan Kettering in New York, uh, Willem Korver, Hans Moreau in the Netherlands, Giuseppe Gaspar in Italy was the first to find these mitoDNA mutations in these tumors. And then collaborators and friends and colleagues uh, that we worked with on our study, Gaddy Getz, uh, Kristen Kubler, who works with Gaddy, Vansi Muta at Mass General, and Raj Gopal, who's in Vansi's lab. Um, and none of this is possible without funding and uh, uh, very generous family uh, supported the Center for Endocrine Tumors at Mass General Hospital, Elizabeth and Michael Ruane, and support the International Thyroid Oncology Group that drives research and clinical trials in thyroid cancer. I'm fortunate to have received money from a foundation that supports cancer research in New York City, the Damon Runyon Cancer Research Foundation, specifically to study Herkel cell tumors. And uh, the American Thyroid Association and FICA itself are generous supporters of thyroid cancer research. So I'll stop sharing my slides and we can kind of work through questions and uh, I'm happy to, to hang out for the rest of the hour here. And uh, thank you all very much for listening and thank you for your time. Dr. McFadden, we do have a couple questions in the Q&A. You, would you like me to read them or do you wanna go in and, cause there's a lot of detail in them. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll go in. Let me figure out how to get my screen share off here. Uh, my mouse is acting funny. Here we go. I stopped it for you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, let's see. And the questions are in the Q&A. So, that... so there's a question that relates to pathology. Encapsulated Herkel cell carcinoma with extensive angioinvasion. Okay. So this is a... a patient who has a thyroid, a Herkel cell thyroid a carcinoma, who's undergone treatment with radioactive iodine and has clear scans and has uh, a slowly but very low rising thyroglobulin. And the question is at what thyroglobulin level would most doctors consider treating again with radioactive iodine? And the sub question, sort of a key question is, is radioactive iodine effective against peripheral cell pathology, specifically the, the case described. So I think that's a very individualized question and you're gonna get different answers from different physicians. I am biased that most thyroid cancers don't take up a lot of, radio, uh, most Herkel cell thyroid cancers don't take up a lot of iodine. So for me, I wouldn't automatically use a thyroglobulin to guide another treatment of radioactive iodine. If I were considering radioactive iodine, I would do a scan where we can give a very low dose of iodine first and ask, is there evidence that this tumor is taking up iodine? But I like to use other types of scans, ultrasounds, occasionally CAT scans, occasionally PET scans to first say, does that low thyroglobulin, can we find where that's coming from before we decide what the best treatment is to, as far as kind of going after radioactive iodine again? or some other types of treatment that are sometimes useful, depending on if you find the little spot that might be making the thyroglobulin. But at a very low level, I'm pretty conservative in, in watching because at a very low level of thyroglobulin, it's often very hard to localize the spot that's making that. But I tend to use other types of scans more than iodine scans in patients with Herkel cell. Because these tumors, part of that, making them so hungry for glucose tends to be switching off the iodine uh, uptake. 
a lot of times. But I would do a little scan before I automatically treat a patient with radioactive iodine. Um, another patient uh, mentions, uh, you know, the possibility that some tumors have deletions in other cancer genes. And so a patient has um, a uh, deletion in a gene called P10 that is one of those genes I mentioned that's kind of uh, found in many cancers that can become a little bit more aggressive. And are there any P10 directed therapies available? And that's a question that's a little bit out of my ballpark because I don't study P10 a lot, but P10 is a, is a gene that's involved in regulating a pathway called the PI3 kinase pathway. So there are sometimes uh, treatments that target that PI3 kinase pathway. Uh, some of those are in clinical trials. So I would ask your uh, local physicians about whether there's any PI3 kinase uh, trials available. Uh, around the country, there's an effort to do a type of trial called a basket trial, where you say a tumor from any part of the body that has a P10 mutation, we're going to treat it with this type of therapy that we think could be useful. So I would look into whether there are basket trials available or whether there are uh, approved medications that are being used in other cancers for P10 deleted tumors. All right, um, another question is, if your thyroid cancer has already been removed, um, are there a way you can learn about the genetic changes in your thyroid cancer? Um, and there's the sort of related to that, would affirma testing be useful? Um, and what do you recommend sort of seeing physicians who have experience in thyroid cancer? Genetic studies can be done on the pathology tissue that is sitting in the pathology archive. And so more and more uh, genetic sequencing studies are available <clears throat> on tissue that was taken out of the body a long time ago. Um, if I would say your thyroid tumor, your Herthel cell tumor has been removed and there's no evidence that it's come back, it would be debatable whether those studies would be useful for, uh, for you to understand the genetic changes. Um, if the Herthel cell tumor comes back someday or spreads, then I think there's potentially value in studying uh, the cancer genome, sort of these diagnostic tests to look at the genetic changes. Now we're in, a, in the early days of this with Herthel the molecular diagnostic companies like Affirma and Thyroseq use those loss of chromosomes to be able to say this is a Herthel cell tumor, but we don't have a treatment, unfortunately, yet that's very, that targets that loss of chromosomes or necessarily that targets the alterations in the mito DNA. And so that's, that's a big area of need for Herthel cell tumors, in my mind, that we need to be able to get to a point sometime soon where we say this is a better treatment. Right now, uh, thyroid cancer patients that have Herthel cell are treated under the umbrella of the, the drugs that treat other forms of thyroid cancer uh, as well. A great question sort of related to the sugar uh, is in the chat as well. Should somebody go on an Atkins diet, a low carbohydrate diet, and might that starve the tumor of sugar? There's no clear evidence that that would work. These tumors are tricky. They find a way to take up sugar. Um, I've seen in other tumor types uh, that it's been suggested when patients are on certain forms of therapy that, that targeting that low sugar in the body could be useful. But we don't know necessarily that the Atkins diet uh, would necessarily help. Uh, the, our whole body is making enough sugar often to support uh, different tissues in the body and the tumors kind of grab onto that sugar that floats around the body. It's an interesting idea um, to kind of be on a low carbohydrate diet and lower your blood glucose levels, but I don't think we know that that would make a, a, a big impact. Let me scroll through here.
So one of the questions goes back to another question goes back to radioactive iodine. And in other words, in a patient who's diagnosed with a purple cell tumor, unlike other follicular or papillary thyroid cancer uh, patients, a physician may say, don't even bother with radioactive iodine. And I think that's an individual decision based on the physician and the patient. There's a lot of evidence that purple cell tumors don't take up iodine. And so some physicians will say, after your initial treatment, if everything looks good, no need to do the iodine right now. And I think that's okay, because just because you don't do iodine up front doesn't mean it can't be used later. Uh, if there's ever a need or a question about is something come back, uh, do we need to, to, to try iodine at that point? And so I think it's reasonable, depending on the specific case, to say, okay, there's Everything looks good right now. It's a Herkel cell. I don't think we need to do iodine, but that's really, there's no clear consensus between experts on when to do that and when not to. So I think uh, seeing somebody who has a lot of knowledge of all thyroid cancers is, is valuable. And I would trust your physician's judgment on kind of holding off for now on iodine rather than automatically uh, doing it. So a great, great, uh, very sophisticated question. So, so Herkel cell tumors are part of this group of tumors that occur in other areas of the body called oncocytic tumors. And even within the thyroid, there are oncocytic variants of papillary thyroid cancer, for example. So those are papillary thyroid cancers that have that uh, big increase in those mitochondria that shows up on that stain, that pink, pink stain I mentioned on the talk. And the question kind of relates to this uh, uh, oncocytic variant of papillary thyroid cancer. And do we know whether they have these chromosomal losses and how do you figure out if that's occurring? Um, if your biopsy happened to undergo genetic testing uh, with one of the genetic uh, platforms that's out there, I know of Firma and ThyroSeq uh, look at the chromosomes you might have an indication from that biopsy, whether it had the chromosomal changes. Um, if, the, uh, if that didn't, if your biopsy didn't have that molecular testing, that's a-okay. And what I would say is most of these oncocytic papillary tumors aren't more aggressive than regular papillary thyroid cancer. And so I wouldn't worry too much whether it has those chromosome changes or not. Um, these Papillaries with the oncocytic features tend to act a lot like regular papillary thyroid cancer. So there's usually not a lot of nuanced or specific treatments right now for oncocytic variant of papillary compared to regular papillary, classic papillary, uh, papillary thyroid cancer. Uh, Dr. McFadden, we, would, we have a request for you to read the question or we can read the question uh, okay. just for some um, visually sure. challenged folks. Gotcha. Okay. I was uh, curious on, on the protocol there because uh, a lot of these are very kind of specific uh, hey. personal cases, um, but I'm happy to read the questions. Okay. Um, we have a question about a 22-year-old. My 22-year-old daughter had purple cell cancer in December. Surgeon was wonderful and believes he was able to get all the cancer and now being monitored with ultrasound tests. Should she be followed by PET scans? Is it uncommon for someone of her age to have had Herkel cell uh, uh, cancer? And, you know, without knowing all the, the nuance of what type of, what did the pathologist exactly say in this case, what I would say is if it was a minimally invasive Herkel cell cancer, we don't always do PET scans. If the thyroglobulin is low, if the surgical uh, margins are all clear, uh, ultrasound and thyroglobulin can often be enough to reassure us, depending on the exact pathology, that things are okay. I tend to get PET scans when the thyroglobulin is higher than I would like it to be in a patient who had kind of a widely invasive Herkel cell, and I'm worried it could have spread. I tend to do 
uh, more PET scans than I do with, say, a follicular carcinoma or a papillary carcinoma. But I, uh, I don't know that most Herkel cell patients won't need a PET scan is kind of what I would say, um, depending on, but it really depends on the exact pathology, whether there was what was called vascular invasion or capsular invasion. If there was a lot of vascular invasion mentioned in the pathology report, I might get a PET scan once just to reassure uh, myself and, and uh, be confident that there was no spread. Um, with respect to the age, these follicular tumors in general and Herkel cell tumors are a little bit less common um, in 20-year-olds. In we do see it on occasion. I would say it's less common uh, to have have to be 20 and have, have that uh, type of cancer. Uh, another question is, I was diagnosed with Herkel cell cancer in 2014, um, and the radioactive iodine did not work. I've had three surgeries, and my surgeon told me right now that surgery is the only option to remove the growths. Are there any studies out there for drugs for Herkel cell cancer? Um, to my knowledge, there aren't specific trials right now for Herkel cell cancer, but there are trials for a variety of approaches uh, that include Herkel cell thyroid cancer. Um, so some of these new targeted therapies that may be effective across multiple forms of thyroid cancer uh, could be effective. There's work to try to figure out whether immune treatments may or may not work in Herkel cell thyroid cancer. And the best way to go kind of figure that out, I would say, is sometimes to go to one of these big centers um, that are doing a lot of the clinical trials in thyroid cancer and get, get input on that. But right now, most of the trials that include thyroid cancer are umbrella. They're, they're focused on all forms of, of thyroid cancer. The next question is, um, is Herthel cell cancer slower growing than other types of thyroid cancers? And is getting Herthel cell associated with lifestyle choices like smoking, radiation exposure, or genetics, inherited genetics? Um, Herthel cell is about the same as other types of thyroid cancer with respect to growth. Many of these are very slow growing. Occasionally, like other forms of thyroid cancer, we run into fast growing Herthel cell tumors. But in general, not a huge difference uh, from what we know. We don't know of a strong association with smoking, uh, with radiation exposure, um, or necessarily inherited conditions that promote Herkel cell tumors. In general, we recommend against all of that anyway, um, but not specifically related to Herkel cell. Um, a question about a firma. A firma test took my 40% risk of purple cell neoplasm and reduced it to 4%. On this basis, I watched and waited until I got tired of spending major dollars to watch this thing grow. Since I had to kind of buck my doctor to seek a surgical consult, then surgery showed cancer, I am unsure of my endocrinologist's judgment moving forward. Uh, with treatment, even though my numbers look very good. Is there value going to a cancer center that sees more purple cell carcinoma for a second opinion about ongoing treatment planning? My advice on this is, is general advice to every patient I see in the clinic. And I will see my patients and, and tell them that if you ever want a second opinion, you're not gonna hurt my feelings. And that my feelings as your physician should be totally out of the equation when you think about uh, getting second opinions. And that I'm here to help. If a patient wants a second opinion, I ask them to let me know so I can help guide them to the right place to get that second opinion uh, based on the expertise of various centers and folks around the country. So my feeling is if you're ever unsure or want reassurance about your treatment plan being okay, that, I, and, and, you know, notwithstanding the financial consequences of going for second opinions, depending on insurance networks and et cetera, if it's feasible, I tell my patients, if you have any qualms or questions, let me help you go to the right place and get 
second opinions. And so I would say I would err on the side of if you have some question, you know, based on this experience of I was told to follow it, it turns out to be a, a cancer and now there's some, some lack of confidence or need for reassurance, I tend to say getting a second opinion is a-okay and sometimes really valuable to, to, to get that uh, kind of busy centers expert to say, hey, I think you're a-okay, basically. And now you can keep following up and you know do this, this, and if ev ever this happens, then come back and see me again, basically. So I, I'm always pro second opinion on any patient I see, because I, I think that's of the utmost importance uh, to be confident in the care you're receiving. Dr. McFadden, there's a question yes. that came in through the chat. Can I just read it to you? Please. Okay. As a military person, I had my DNA captured in 1994 and stored in St. Louis, Army four years. I had an HCC diagnosis in 07 with two surgeries, partial and total thyroidectomy, and RAI 101 millicuries and NED since. Can an HCC patient like myself um, assist you genetically in a case study um, or something to dig into before and after? So, so first off, thank you for, for your interest and, and generosity. It depends on whether tissue is available, basically. And, and one thing I didn't get into deeply in the talk is how do we figure out scientifically how to go after some of these changes that we picked up in purple cell cancer? And and a lot of the changes that, that we studied were from these old hospital specimens. We can, we can look at the genes and genetic changes. Now, our focus of research is shifting toward uh, fresh, like right, out, right as it comes out of surgery, before the tissue has been processed by the pathologist, we try to get a little piece and freeze it. And by doing so, we can look at all sorts of metabolites. We can try to figure out if we can grow these tumors that come from our patients in the tissue culture, in the basically petri dishes in the lab, or by putting a little piece of a tumor in a mouse to see if that can grow. So our research effort has shifted from the, the old specimens to this fresh stuff that allows us to look at a lot more than we can in the processed tissue. Um, so right now, my group is specifically, uh, you know, won't change a lot based on your generosity uh, right there. But absolutely, as a group, you know, being plugged into patient registries and so forth as these are being developed would be beneficial for us to learn more about uh, how Herthel cell patients do years and years later after their initial treatments. So thank you again. We have a four minutes left scheduled, but we can go over three to four minutes as well. Okay, um, let me go through the questions and feel free to interrupt if you see more stuff coming in through the chat uh, as well. Um, uh, another question, I'm in a study at NIH involving dotatate scans and future treatments similar to REI. It looks like there is hope Herthel, with Herthel. Have you heard anything on this? Um, I think there's, there's work to do kind of pair radiation like radioactive iodine to these other types of tracers that go to tumors. And so I know there's a big effort in that across multiple cancer types. And I, I didn't know specifically about trying to pair that with Herthel, but that's great, great news overall. Um, do Herthel cell, next question is, do Herthel cell metastases uh, respond well to external beam radiation in the hip? And I would say yes. We have had patients who have uh, these metastases uh, to bones in the hip, and often the tumors will shrink or stop growing in response to the external beam radiation. Question about targeted therapies or immunotherapies specific for herpal cell. Um, not yet necessarily. There's some work that some uh, inhibitors along a pathway called mTOR are being studied in herpal cell patients. Um, uh, uh, they're 
drugs like uh, Everolimus is the name of one of them. So there are some, some studies ongoing to look at that mTOR pathway that I didn't talk a lot about today in herpal cell cancer. So that's one thing to look into. Um, and as those of you who are asking about clinical trials, you might look into to that. Um, immunotherapies, I think, are right now are being kind of put, put together um, with other forms, herpals being lumped together with other forms of thyroid cancer, but I'm not at the forefront of all those clinical trials, so there could be something I'm, I'm missing. Another question about the lowest thyroglobulin level that's cause for concern, and that's a really challenging question to answer because it's very patient-specific based on, did you have radioactive iodine? In which case the thyroglobulin would probably be a little bit lower. I tell a lot of my patients that I'm focused on the change in thyroglobulin over time. So a patient may have a low thyroglobulin that is stable for years and years. And I tend not to be very worried about those. It's the thyroglobulin that increases and increases and increases over time that I get worried about. Uh, a question is Herthel considered a terminal diagnosis? And in most cases, uh, no, but it really depends again on the individual case on whether Herthel cell cancer has spread to other parts of the body. Is it growing rapidly in other parts of the body? So Herthel cell is a tumor that can spread and can be terminal. Uh, and we need better treatments for those cases when it does. But many times Herthel cell cancer and most of the times Herthel cell cancer is not uh, a terminal diagnosis. Dr. McFadden, um, yes. I just want to let you know, we are at 1230. I know we can stay a minute or two over, but before um, any of our guests leave, I wanted to remind them that all the sessions that have been recorded throughout the, um, the conference are going to be available on demand through the conference website. And that, that will start later this afternoon and tomorrow. I can answer a couple more of these questions and then maybe we'll shut it down uh, Great. Uh, after that. Um, I've heard there's a low recurrence rate for herpal cell carcinoma. Daughter had a hemithyroidectomy. In your experience, what are the chances that the other lobe could develop herpal cell carcinoma? It, it's a little different than papillary cancer. Um, that can kind of show up in the other lobe. Usually Herthel cell cancer doesn't show up in the other lobe. And all of the stuff that I've talked about today, I would phrase it under a, a, a kind of a phrase I use for my patients is, I never say never and I never say 100% because in medicine, we're really not that good. So we tend to say what we expect and what is less likely or more likely, but any time in medicine you start to talk in absolutes, in my experience, you're setting yourself up to be humbled. Um, so a lot of my kind of guidance here on these questions is in, is in general terms. So uh, nothing I should say uh, should be taken as an absolute in either direction. Um, where are Herthel cell cancers being studied the most extensively from a patient care perspective? These are gonna be the big centers for thyroid cancer across the country. So any center that's a huge thyroid cancer center, um, those are the places that include thinking a lot and working a lot on purple uh, cell cancer. Any of the big centers are at the forefront of purple cell cancer. Um, can herpal cell cancer recur without going, seeing the thyroglobulin go up? And this is one of those never say never, never say 100% type of things. It can, it's not very, frequent, uh, but every rule in medicine can be broken. Um, but it's, it's not common for that to happen. So I think that's all of the, all of the questions. So thank you everybody uh, for your time. Um, um, I wanna thank Thyka for inviting me to be here and Gary specifically. Um, and uh, take care everybody and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you very much, Dr. McFadden. We really appreciate your time today and all the great information that you shared with us. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.